Recent polls have shown most Americans have a declining sense of trust in the media and the political dialogue. The media, with their politicians, are in many cases reduced to partisan talking points. However, given the threats to our economy, freedom of speech, and our security, we are looking to engage with those candidates running for election in 2024 who will address our primary issues. Well, my policies align more with Democrats. And then I have some policies that are very independent in nature. I don't believe in falling the herd down a cliff. I would never do that. And so, you know, I don't follow the party lines if I feel that something is wrong. And, uh, for example, now I'm calling out uh, what happened with uh, the solar industry in California and Gover Governor Gavin Newsom has, has signed a bill that is basically allowing uh, utility companies to charge based on our income, you know, the utility rates based on income. And when I see that, I'm not going to say that I'm a Democrat and I'm going to support that. No, it's wrong. It's completely wrong. My name is Jim Connor. Welcome to Game Changers Silicon Valley. Today, I'm pleased that Rishi Kumar, a candidate for California's 16th district in the House of Representatives, which includes a large part of Silicon Valley. Rishi, welcome to the show. Great to be here. I admire your perseverance. You've run for Congress several times, and you're getting closer and closer each time. Let's go back and let you give us a little overview. What happened in the last election? Did you see us moderately or somewhat successful? And what do you plan to do going forward? Yeah. Well, we expected to win, Jim, and uh, we didn't make it, uh, but we did better than any other challenger in the last 30 years. Last 30 years? 42%, uh, and uh, it was a low turnout election, and uh, and uh, quite blessed to get so much support from our district. We had policies that resonated with people. We had policies on, on ha housing, traffic, homelessness, about climate, about health care, and uh, you know, we enjoyed the conversations we had. We had uh, thousands of students who joined us uh, from different parts of the country to support this run. We are blessed to have the support from students here in Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Saratoga, Los Altos, San Jose. So it was great. It was great to have the support, and I couldn't have done it without them. So tremendous gratitude to the voters, uh, to our students, interns, and also to you, Jim, for bringing me on again, you know. It was my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. I had, I believe, five or six candidates on. They were all challengers. Uh, a couple made it through. I don't know if any of them, got, I don't think any of them got elected, but I, I absolutely enjoyed it because I do completely um, feel that it's our responsibility here in public or community television to give local candidates uh, a, a platform to speak because the media is drowning out all the challengers and just promoting the incumbents on both sides of the party, for that matter. Very so, true. So uh, I, I think we should all do this. I'm, I'm going to try to be an advocate for all community access public stations to bring in local candidates of all parties that way. That's great. We need it for sure. All right. Well, we got four big issues here. And I think uh, we should talk a little about the partisanship that's going on in Congress today. I mean, we have gridlock. And now we have a movement to uh, sort of address the budget deficit and a new budget and all that type of stuff. And you and I chat a little bit about the big problem being the economy, because we are in inflation. What's your sense of where we are in the economy and the risk to our, uh, to our system? So Jim, I think the biggest threat we have today is the de-dollarization that is happening globally. You know, we see that uh, there is movement now to undermine the future of the US dollar for a variety of reasons. And within here in the United States, I see SEC's Gary Gensler who is not in favor of the digital and crypto economy. And uh, we don't have a plan for CBDC yet. Uh, and China has already rolled that out. India is running a pilot. So there's movement across the world, which is uh, looking at different options. And uh, if, do if the dollar is not the global standard anymore, we will find some huge ripples playing out in the US economy. And that might mean an upheaval that we have even, have you haven't seen before. And when you look at the deficit of $31.5 trillion, you know, it's a staggering number. It's a staggering number. And uh, as long as the U.S. can keep printing our own currency, we are probably okay. But the moment we don't have that option anymore, we are in, the, in a huge trouble. So I think the imperative for President Biden is to figure out, you know, how, that de how to stop that de-dollarization. That train is in motion, and we have to stop that. So the economy 
is, is paramount. You know, this is what we need to do. We need to preserve and protect American jobs. And I don't see a whole lot of that happening yet. I don't see the awareness. I agree with you 100%. There is almost no awareness. People have an attitude that I see, not across the board, but a, a, a large part of Congress says, we just, just print some more money. Just print some more money. And, and then, Jim, the threat of AI, I mean, you have seen ChatGPT and BARD and uh, Binge and all these different uh, uh, AI solution, open AI solutions that have been rolled out. And, uh, you know, the impact of that, right? The jobs are going to be disappearing over mm -hmm. time. And I can already see how the announcements are happening that, oh, we have been impacted by ChatGPT. So this is, again, going to have an impact on the U.S. economy. Right. And uh, we, U.S. needs to chart a new course. I think we need some visionaries. We need folks taking charge and figuring out, you know, how this changing landscape is going to impact us as a country and what do we need to do. I, I don't even see that happening. Mm. Do you have any thoughts? yourself about directions, what would be the top priorities in that, changing that, that effort. You know, I agree with you. China has started their own, mono, uh, or their own digital currency, and they yeah. forced everybody to use it. They said, hey, okay, you don't have a choice anymore. That's it. And then, of course, I think a couple countries, I believe Saudi Arabia and maybe one or two others, have decided or agreed to use Chinese currency for their trade, not the U.S. dollar. Yeah, exactly. So I know we can't stop that, but we have to be more proactive. Any thoughts on your side, as a newly elected congressperson, of what you might suggest or promote? You know, I think we need to first start with uh, stopping the de-dollarization because we are going to lose our standing in the world. So we need to come up with a plan for that. I, I don't know if it's on the current radar of uh, Washington to see how we can do that. And secondly, when it comes to the digital currency, I've seen a white paper on the CBDC that was rolled out in Washington, but I don't think so. We are even running a pilot. There are countries in the, across the world that are running a pilot because you know, if we are going to lose the U.S. dollar as, as a global uh, peg, then we have to figure out other areas of opportunities. And if the Chinese yuan, the CBDC that they are rolling out, becomes the benchmark standard in Africa and Asia and in, in, in Russia, you know, we, we are in big trouble at that point. You know? So we, we need to be proactive and uh, we just cannot be resting on our laurels. We have succeeded as a country for a few hundred years. It's worked out really well for us, but it might change in a nanosecond, and we need to put together a plan for that. You know? And then thirdly, with the threat of AI, it's not really a threat. We have to embrace it. You know? I mean, you can see that with any evolution of technology, with the steam engine or the automobile or whatever else that was happening, it could create more jobs. So we need to look at education you know, like for example, I've heard that prompt engineers are making like 300K a year just for the ability to write prompts for the open AI world, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out, you know, how we're going to adapt our education. I was just telling my son the other day that the traditional ways of learning computer science is probably gone because you will be writing code through these uh, different uh, options that currently exist, you know? So the world is changing. We need to adapt our educational system first and foremost so that we get our kids prepared for the future, you know. That needs to happen. We need to start thinking in those terms, and it doesn't mean that we'll do it three or five years later. We have to start thinking about it now. And I believe Washington should take charge. But the problem is we have, uh, Elon Musk calls it the gerontocracy, yeah. has been there for a long, long time, and I don't think so that they are equipped to handle the challenges today. And you look at uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, who I have a lot of respect for, I noticed that uh, you know, there is a push now to have her resign because of uh, health conditions. You know? So we are politicians who have stayed there for too long. They have lost their grip over the world, and that's the reason why America is falling behind. Mm -hmm. So the imper imperative is upon the two of us, Jim, to make that change. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a big fan, as you are, of term limits. I, I believe that you know, at a certain age and a certain point, and uh, you know, I know many of the Congress people have been there many years, up to 30, 40 years, and both sides, both sides. Ch Chuck Grassley's been there for a very long time. Uh, Diane's been, Diane Feinstein, even uh, Ann Ashley has been a very long time. I just think we have to have some new blood, and there seems to be a resistance on both parties to this inevitable change until they pass away, unfortunately. So, uh, but I'd love to see newer people like you, uh, especially with a tech background. See, that's what's so important. You have people in Congress that have no idea what's going on. They barely use the internet barely use email, and their staff do all this stuff for them. So I would hope that we as a society, the country, start to say, 
maybe I'm not the most technical person in the world, but I need someone in Washington who is, and, and have, that, have that be a, a, a key factor, and so on. And, and you know, Jim, the other aspect of this is uh, the complete misuse of power. When you look at the insider trading that our senators and congressmen are, use, are basically, they're going about with like, I don't give a damn. You know, I'm going to use this platform and uh, make money. And, uh, and that's not what our forefathers had envisioned with respect to farmers and bankers and teachers and blacksmiths jumping into political service and going right back. But this has become a very drastic story that's playing out. It used to play out in Sacramento. We stopped that with term limits, mm -hmm. but it's now playing out in Washington. So we need to do that. But unfortunately, the ones, it's like the fox guarding the hen house. Will they get themselves out of a job? <laughs> Never. I don't think so. And it, it means that it has to be an outrage from people across the United States. We need to be talking about it. And this is how people across the United States need to cast their vote and make change happen, you know. Mm -hmm. Agree 100%. Um, I, I want to give you a chance just to talk a little bit about, well, you've just touched on ethics now. So that is a huge issue, uh, this ethics. And again, you see it across the board. Uh, I've seen a couple of things happen. I go, wait, Republicans did that? And, oh, Democrats did that? And I go, well, they're both doing it. It's a, it's yeah. a don't rock the boat mentality or don't you let anybody fall by the, you know, be exposed, we'll say. What's your thought of the current level of social disruption, the crime, homelessness, social area? Any thoughts about that? So my run is about ethics and politics. Uh, this is how we started in 2019. That was my platform in uh, the 2020 run. We made it to the general election with that platform. And then again in 2022, it was about ethics and politics. Because I see so many wrong things happening around me. And uh, we don't want America to become a third world, third world country where it's, uh, it's basically and crime is a cornerstone of that, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at countries across the world and there's like crime happening all around you. And uh, I came into this country uh, to study graduate school mechanical engineering on the East Coast and there was no crime. Now in the last couple of decades, I see a huge change that has happened. And crime was the foundation of my Silicon Valley, uh, my success as a council member of Saratoga, getting reelected with the most votes in 66 years of Saratoga. In my reelection effort, because we dropped burglaries by 50%. You know, through a series of, like I had over 100 neighborhood meetings talking about crime, rolling out neighborhood watch programs, uh, having neighbors know each other, rolling out block parties, and things like that, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. we need to take charge. Mm -hmm. Crime is a serious challenge. And in fact, it's, it's, uh, it has festered with Prop 47. I was against Prop 47, and I remember sitting, sitting down with senators talking about the failure of Prop 47, and I was told that, no, just give it, give it a few years you will see the impact of Prop 47. And we have clearly seen crime go completely haywire. Yeah, yeah but what was the main thing? Oh, so essentially, you know, treating criminals with a lot more leniency. Oh, that's right. Instead of going to a judge, you were actually were t sitting and talking to a, a sheriff department, yeah. and they were basically making a call on you, and they don't want to lock you up, so they would let you go, and the limit, $950. So, right. you know, the Prop 47, essentially, I could tell back then that the crime is going to go up, and we saw that. In Saratoga, the crime had gone up by 100% in, in a space of like six years. And then we corrected that, we brought it down. So in Washington, if I was sitting in Biden's spot, I would basically, it's a tremendous platform to be the president of the United States. You can do anything you like, or at least use that platform to air out your thoughts and make change happen. And I would like Biden to be addressing crime because it's, it's a significant concern that is sweeping the nation everywhere you go. You know? That's right. This crime issue, uh, especially this Prop 47, I, I believe it's a misdemeanor up under $950 misdemeanor per person. Do you have any thoughts of how do you tackle such a big problem? It starts with education, which is what I did in the city of Saratoga. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, here are simple things like, like uh, you know, I remember uh, I had a meeting. Uh, my office colleagues, we were there in the city. And uh, we, we are going to walk into our meeting area and we had parked the car on the, on the street. And I pick up my laptop bag and my colleague says, well, why don't, I, why don't you just leave it here, Rishi? And I was like, no, I just feel I, feel I want to take it. And I see those laptop bags sitting in the back seat and I'm like, something wrong with this? But you know, I was like, we were thinking about the meeting, we walked in, we come back like an hour later, glass is shattered and all the laptop bags are gone. And so if we, create simple best practices for watching out to, for our neighbors, not keeping valuables in the car. Like when we go to AMC Mercado, you know what we do, Jim? You know, we roll down our windows, we leave everything open, like, hey guys, take whatever you want. Because what they do is they are smashing cars, you know. 
-hmm. So it comes from, at a local level, we need diligent engagement from our elected leaders, mm -hmm. from the city council and the counties across, across the country. And then, you know, the onus is also about Washington to change this because uh, things have gone completely haywire over the last, I would say, six, eight years, things are really bad. And uh, we need to figure out a way to take control, but also provide the tools that local uh, city council members, local counties need. For example, like our city, we did not have a neighborhood watch program that was sort of regulator or even funded. But I personally rolled out 59 neighborhood watch programs in Saratoga. And then uh, when I was a council member, and then our city council decided that we should make it part of a program. Now it's a well-funded program. You know, we invite neighborhood leaders together. We talk about best practices. We have the meet with the sheriff. We are uh, helping out by putting uh, ALPR cameras. So it's a significant change that has happened in our city, but it started from creating awareness and education. Mm -hmm. And so it needs funding too, because all these things, they don't, they, they don't come cheap. So we need to create a funding model and get citizens engaged, because the more awareness we create, the better off we are. Yeah. I'm going to ask you about this, um, the party you're representing, the Democratic Party. I, I, if you don't mind me saying, they haven't treated you very well. That's my take, I, my honest opinion. Well, Jim, when you're a challenger, they will treat you badly, which is okay. <laughs> Things change once you win and you're on the other side. I you know? see. So you get the benefit if you're on the other side. But I'm I, totally okay with that. Treat me badly. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's always tough, you know, you're running and uh, you're, you're the, I think you're a great candidate myself. But have you ever thought about entertaining the independent platform? I mean, I would, if I was you, because you've got a strong Democratic base that follows you, and you've got independents representing somewhere between 30 and 50 percent now of the electorate. It's growing, and I just seems to me common sense that the candidate who engages the, the moderate, independent platform voters is going to do pretty well. Yeah. Did that occur? Is that something you're thinking? Well, my policies align more with Democrats, and then I have some policies that are very independent in nature. I don't believe in falling the herd down a cliff. I would never do that. And so, you know, I don't follow the party lines if I feel that something is wrong. And uh, for example, now I'm calling out uh, what happened with uh, the solar industry in California, and Gover Governor Gavin Newsom has, has signed a bill that is basically allowing uh, utility companies to charge based on our income, you know, their utility rates based on income. And when I see that, I'm not going to say that I'm a Democrat and I'm going to support that. No, it's wrong. It's completely wrong. So yes, m many of my policies are aligning with the Democratic Party. Many, many of my policies would be as an independent would, because it's about uh, people-centric behavior. We need to have policies that are about America, about the people of this country, about the people of our congressional district. Yeah. And then finally, some of my policies align with the Republicans too. Because why? Because I'm here to serve, and there are not just Democrats who live in my district, there are also Republicans. And I need to figure out a stance which will cater to the majority in spite of the party, you know. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, this, uh, you mentioned this earlier about this bill that's signed by Governor Newsom. Is this a bill now that's in effect? And when does it take place and how is this going to work? They're going to look at your tax return and say, oh, you made X uh, adjusted gross income, therefore your, your, your new pg a rate is Y? Is that correct? Yes. What so, is the name of this bill? Uh, so this was signed uh, last year, I believe. And now PUC is currently looking at implementing the bill. So. And, and so it's an energy bill. It's supposed to be, you know, addressing the climate needs and all that kind of stuff. But part, one of the components is the fact that Jim makes $10 million a year or whatever. Based on that, Jim would, Jim's service charge would be $2,000 because he can afford to pay for it, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also what they're doing is they're reducing your per kilowatt hour charges. Mm -hmm. And so Jim would pay only two cents each kilowatt hour because they are really reducing the price of electricity, but they're increasing the fixed cost. So their revenue is a lot more predictable. They will do well over time. But also what they're doing is they are actually reducing the solar industry, which has been a huge threat. California talks about climate, we talk about green, but how can we let this play out? So again, it's a flawed policy that's playing out in Sacramento because uh, sometimes you get swayed by these types of bills. We never know who is behind these types of bills. Is it PG&E and Southern, Southern uh, California Edison? You know, who, who are behind these bills? But then it's going to play out in terms of how we will see that. And people tell me it's already too late. It's already signed. 
But no, we can push back because PUC ultimately has to implement this, and there's still an opportunity for us to exert pressure on that. You know. So if we want to get involved, will we contact PUC, contact our representatives in uh, state government? Uh, I believe Josh Becker is my senator, and I believe uh, Mark yeah. Berman. Is that the way to go about it? Or? Well, uh, we made it a lot easier. So I think at this point, we are going to the PUC. So if you go to rishikumar.com slash PGE, you'll find the whole uh, policy description and a call to action. So basically sending out emails to PUC, letting them know what you feel about it. And there's also a petition on there, you know, and that petition is directed towards Governor Gavin Newsom because the pressure will happen over time because it's in the very early stages. This came out like uh, a month or so back uh, with lots of news articles and people started figuring out, they, they started reaching out, Rishi, this is a matter of grave concern for us. So if we can exert pressure and and at least overturn aspects of this particular bill, I think that will be conducive for our future. Otherwise, we'll be uh, in a state of mess. More reasons to leave California for people, <laughs> is that right? That's really what, yeah. In California, you look at the census from the last yeah. one. We lost a congressional seat. In, in California, right. we have shrunk by one. Florida, Texas, they have gained. And in the next 10 years, we'll, we might lose another. You know? So the exodus is happening not only from here in Silicon Valley, but also across California. So let me uh, compliment you. I mean, you as a private individual, not in state or federal government, are running this program on your website to say what's going on with this pg e measure and what, how we could register our uh, concern about it through your website, Rishi Kumar slash pg e Rishikumar.com slash pg e yep. Very good. And, and this is what I've been doing. Like, uh, you know, I've been an activist for many years when San Jose Water Company is raking in millions of dollars, their profits have gone from $20 million to $50 million with surcharges and things like that. I believe we have to express our voice, engage people, and make change happen in a positive way. People-centric behavior, people-centric policies, and be there to help the people. And uh, it has done well for me as a council member of Saratoga. And we seek to take that same energy, integrity, and activism to Washington. Okay, well, very good. So. You're up and running, you're a candidate. How should, what should people do to help you out? Well, you know, it's a question of uh, money in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, we spent about $1.4 million in our runs, and uh, Anna Eshu spent about $4 million. So that money is a huge advantage that incumbents have. So we have to raise money to win this race. And uh, we are looking at other areas of opportunities. We have to be creative, but at the same time, one policy will never change. I will never ever take the dark tainted money that has become a norm in America. You know, Anna Eshu gets 50% of her money from PACs and special interest groups. And people have told me, have reached out to me in the last few months that Rishi, for you to win, you have to change that policy. And my take is my policy will never change whether I'm a candidate or when I'm in Washington because this is how we can restore integrity back to American politics. I admire your policy. As I've said before in another show, it's tough because everybody else is taking corporate money, PAC money, special interest money, and it puts you at such a disadvantage. And as much as I, I admire that, I think it's so honorable, nobody else is doing it. Doesn't that put you at a huge disadvantage? It does, but at the same time, you know, why did we do 42% in the last election, better than any challenger in the last 30 years? Because people respect that. I would tell people that if they spend five minutes comparing and contrasting, uh, Rishi Kumar versus the incumbent, it would, the light bulb would click in their head that they need to vote for Rishi. Well, you've been outstanding again. I really enjoy you on the show here. You're so um, insightful, honest, high integrity. You have your principles and you, you stay by it. So, and you know what's going on in the government. So, and the demonetization of the dollar also. So I want to uh, uh, just uh, express how do people follow up? Is it mainly the website? Correct. RishiKumar.com. Follow me on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook, social media. All the same thing, Rishi Kumar. Yeah, okay. RishiKumar.com. Well, you'll find all these links through Rishi, RishiKumar.com. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I want to wish you every success going forward. I thank you for your uh, time today, and I uh, look forward to the 2024 election. Thank you, Jim, for inviting me back. Thanks for joining us in this episode. If you gain insights from this conversation, share this show with your network. You can view all shows at our website, GameChangers.tv, as well as the podcast at Game Changers Silicon Valley. We look forward to your continued interest in upcoming shows.